from the pharmaceutical industry's trade association known as Pharma that plots the annual cumulative R&D investment starting in 1995 going through 2013. This looks all very impressive, uh, but there's no mention that these are constant $1995. So if you do that calculation, you'll see that we have been flatlined globally over the last three years at $33 billion, which is a huge number, but this includes clinical trials, it includes manufacturing of test article prior to uh, preclinical or animal testing and then clinical trials, regulatory submissions, so on and so forth. So that's not a very robust area of continued investment either financially. In addition to all of the above, there's growing recognition that the reproducibility of science uh, has uh, a lot of gaps. And it's not just related to animal-based research. I'm co-chair of a group known as the ILAR Roundtable, and we've had two workshops uh, over the past six months. Uh, the, the first one was in June at the National Academies uh, dealing with reproducibility, or actually lack thereof. Uh, and this is available on ILAR's website, but we're only the latest voice to highlight this issue and raise concerns. And some of the data are very compelling. This is a study uh, that was uh, published by a major multinational pharmaceutical and chemical firm where they looked at published studies in three realms, oncology, women's health, cardiovascular. These are animal-based studies. The second graph is how those data from those published studies were to be uh, assessed. And then the third uh, pie chart is what actually happened. And what actually happened, which is in quotes at the bottom, is only 20 to 25 percent of the projects could replicate uh, the findings that had been published earlier. It's a very sobering statistic. And so a lot of people are looking at this now very carefully and have come to probably this conclusion. It's not, and I'll repeat, it's not that animal models are not informative or that they're worthless, it's that we're talking about sloppy science. And so the studies that get published haven't been uh, screened thoroughly enough. More importantly, they haven't been designed well enough. So many of them are missing all of the things that you would expect in sound experimental design. And here's six flags uh, as an example um, that are missing in many of these studies. Uh, that can't be reproduced when biotech or pharma or the medical device industry needs to replicate these when they go in-house and they're developing the next vaccine or the next drug or the next implantable device. And so here's concern number one, based on all of the above. We know that changing an animal's immediate environment may lead to an influence on its biology, and so if the husbandry is varied, may that vary the data that's generated uh, with that animal? So let's take Institution A as an example. It has a standard package of one kind of manufactured uh, individual ventilated cage rack for its mice. It may use hardwood chip bedding. It may get its diet from Purina. It may acidify its water to keep down the bacterial counts. And the enrichment it provides in those cages could be cotton uh, nestlet uh, gauze swabs, like this one. Institution B, just as tight a package, but slightly different. Maybe they have a low-velocity ventilated cage into which the mice are placed. And they may use corn cob bedding and a Teclad uh, branded diet. And the water may be hyperchlorinated. And instead of nestlets, they may have plastic or cardboard huts that the animals can play around on the inside. Are these equivalent? Maybe, maybe not. And so is this another flag uh, of a risk of loss of reproducibility? What I've told my department heads, if you're recruiting somebody to bring their lab to Harvard, you can promise them that we will recreate to the T all of the components that they had in their previous lab at Stanford or University of Washington or University of Michigan or Rice or wherever so that they don't have to think about this. 
And because the air in this country blows from the west coast to the east, those mice are eventually going to get the same air anyway. So they don't have to worry. And I don't want to have a competitive advantage in this facet, so I'd like to encourage all of my peers uh, to consider making the same promise. And we'll get into some of the details on how that's affordable later in this talk. Talk about concern number two. As science changes, the need for a different animal model may change. And so what if my mice, or what if my science now demands I have a different color cage, or a different shape cage, or a different size cage, or I may want to use sand for bedding? Those of you who are familiar with ulcerative dermatitis in black six uh, strain mice know it's a big problem. What if somebody discovers that sand eliminates that clinical lesion? What are we going to do? Uh, and what if it doesn't matter? And what if I want to feed my mice raw carrots and lettuce every day um, because the science that I'm interested in now pursuing that I just got funded to perform requires that? So on and so on and so on. The problem today is programs like mine usually say no. You can't do that because this is what we provide. And if you want to do anything extra, you're going to have to do it yourself, and we're still going to charge you full price on the per diem services because it's an outlier, and it's a pain in the neck. And uh, we won't stand in your way, uh, but uh, we're not going to go to great lengths, usually, uh, to make that happen for you. I'll give you an example. This is a study published uh, four years ago now in which the same strain of mouse was administered, the same tumors under the skin. The only difference was uh, that some mice were housed in a uh, standard micro-isolator cage with regular bedding and maybe a nestlet or some other simple enrichment device. The other group was housed, <coughs> excuse me, on the right in this amusement park of all kinds of goodies. There are exercise wheels that are vertical. There are horizontal exercise wheels. There are tunnels. There are cardboard huts. There are plastic huts, so on and so forth. And when the tumor growth was analyzed, even I can tell from the back of the room that the control group in the standard housing, those tumors grew much larger than the tumors uh, harvested at the same time grew in the amusement park uh, environment. Even more curious, if you took the blood from the amusement park mice and injected it into the regular housing mice, those regular housing mice now became much more resistant to those tumors. So what's going on biologically? I haven't followed this, so I don't know if this has been validated or whatever. But if I'm an investigator and I now want an amusement park, because I'm in oncology, and maybe I'm a physician where I'm seeing patients and their families in the morning and I'm having my mice tended to, and I'm examining them in the afternoon, I need some answers. How can you, as the lab animal veterinarian, help me get to that point more easily? And again, unfortunately, our answer is like what Henry Ford, who's pictured here, used to say about Model Ts. You can have any color you want as long as it's black. And so this is our, this is our uh, usual answer to all of this. This is a, a very representative mouse housing room uh, in a large-scale vivarium. And when we manage these, we are so proud that every cage and every rack is from the, a single manufacturer. Every cage bedding level is only a, a half inch or a three-eighths of an inch. We've maxed out that standardization. The water is treated universally throughout the entire facility. We're using the same disinfectants. We're on the same light cycle. We're measuring the temperature and humidity faithfully, and it's all the same. And it's only the same. So my conclusion today is, based on the science realities, we do the wrong things very well. And so that's where we're at this, this crossroads uh, of sorts. So let me give you an alternative vision and the business experiment that we're running in my department. Ford no longer makes just Model Ts. They make lots of different models, lots of different colors, all kinds of different features. And so what we want to prove or disprove is can we switch from a standardized, one-size, must-fit-all to a customized animal care service? 
And in this case, it will be investigator driven uh, and it makes them happy. It will be in compliance with the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals and other regulations and practice standards and expectations. So the IACUC is happy. And the bet we want to place is can we do this at no additional cost? Every lab animal care program in the country, if not the world, doesn't break even or make a profit. I haven't found one yet. Some people think they are profitable because we will charge our cost to the investigator and we may cover our direct costs, but then people conveniently forget about overhead, uh, amortization, depreciation, so on and so forth. Nobody breaks even. We're all subsidized. So that at Harvard, the institution picks up 75% of the cost of a mouse cage per day. We charge the investigator 25%. Our price is a dollar one that we charge to the grants, to the investigators. That same price somewhere else could be 50 cents, 83 cents, a dollar seven or a dollar 50. The price only reflects the difference in the subsidy. How much money does the institution have and how badly does it want to write a bigger check to either attract or retain star scientists? That's what it comes down to. The costs are all the same. There's only a couple of ways you can maintain mice on an industrial scale. So that the, the picture I showed you earlier of the mouse racks in a standard room could be in almost any uh, medium to large scale program uh, in this country, and you'll now see the same thing in Brazil, you'll see it in China, uh, you'll see it in India, so on and so forth, in addition to Western Europe, Korea, South Korea, and Japan. And so that the challenge is going to be to make this happen with all of its additional complexities in management at no additional cost to somebody. And I just want to highlight that custom uh, is for the customer. And there are people who used to smirk when I use this word in academia because we are colleagues and we serve as, uh, as peers to uh, scientists, so on and so forth. They pay us to provide a service. And if they don't get funded, we don't get paid. So let's understand where the customer service and the business relationship lies. So how are we going to do this? Well, let me make it even more challenging. What I envision is a single room filled with just about every imaginable manufacturer's ventilated rack as possible. And I'm using mice here today as the primary example because they're the most popular mammal. They're still probably the most popular vertebrate. Zebrafish are catching up quickly. But if you can imagine a room with three or four different types of racks in there, and every cage in that room uh, has a different combination of something. Now let's make it even more challenging. Let's add the old-fashioned static rack or static cage on a rack uh, that is still in use in many places. Most, pro most programs, most institutions will buy in bulk from a single vendor. The vendors love it because it's a big check that's written. But if you're going to get into variety, certainly there are ways you can rent these racks. You can buy them used. You can get them as loaners if you need them for a little while and then give them back, so on and so forth. So there is financial flexibility in making this happen in the room. That should not be a barrier to anybody if the scientists so require or request this kind of variety. Step one is we're going to uh, leverage what's known as lean technology, Toyota production systems, which has been in vogue uh, for the last 60 years since it was first developed and codified by Toyota and they still haven't stopped, it involves identifying and eliminating unnecessary work. Not unnecessary workers, big difference. And there are processes and tools and metrics that are available for doing this. We got into this in a big way when I was at Mass General Hospital uh, for uh, about nine and a half years directing their program and became a leader in this field in anticipation that at some point soon, costs were going to get squeezed and we had to become more efficient. And so now we're getting into this and I'll characterize us as the A or the double A level if MGH and other players are in the major leagues. Uh, so we're training our staff to identify 
things that are puzzling, that makes no sense, that seem wasteful, that seem stupid, and then empowering them to create a variety of business or operational experiments and measure the results and see if we save money, time. We can't impact animal welfare and we can't impact science negatively. Uh, we may enhance it, uh, but this is a this is a waste elimination process, pure and simple. And if you're wondering about the different categories of waste, Merley and Associates, which is a lean consulting group out of Connecticut, has a very nice uh, way to remember this in terms of downtime and what, what each one of those stand for. Uh, we always have people read this book, The Goal, to get started. It's a business novel about a guy who is running a failing factory somewhere in the Midwest. This was his hometown originally, so he's a hero, uh, but he's been told he has three months to, to turn it around or they're gonna shut it down and lay everybody off. And because it's a novel, uh, his marriage is on the rocks because he's spending too much time in the office. And so it leads you through his learning of how to think lean and apply those in his factory. Same thing happens in a mouse uh, facility. We assemble mouse cages when we change animals into a clean cage. We disassemble them, we process them through cage wash and autoclave, we refill them, and they go back. It is an assembly line. We check on these animals every day. That's a standard process. Anything that's standardized is fair game. I also refer people to the current Fortune uh, Best Admired Companies list. This is the current one. What have they already figured out that we may borrow or steal to use in our world? We're probably the only industry left that doesn't compare ourselves to other industries because we've been so insulated for many years. Uh, but uh, we're, we're learning in, in my program now and, and at Mass General previously uh, a lot of very interesting ways to leverage some of their best practices. Uh, and so when I've explained this to program managers, program directors in the past, they say, that sounds great, but we could never do that. And my response is, of course you can. And so here's some advice on getting started. It doesn't matter where you start, pick any task. Even better if you ask your technicians for some ideas so that they will engage in the process and have some ownership. Make sure everybody's involved who's gonna be impacted in terms of planning and in terms of execution and analyzing the results. And make sure you measure where you are today. We tell people, take a lot of photographs of how cluttered or disorganized your storage areas are now. And then once you go through a few lean management tools, one is known as 5Sing, look at it later, and you need the historical record to appreciate how far you've come. It's okay to start small. My advice is take one rack that doesn't even have mice on it and just label them. Uh, package A, B, C, and D, or combination A, B, C, and D and have your technicians play around with how would they manage turnover of those cages without screwing it up. No animals are involved, you don't need an IACUC protocol. It's great practice and gets folks into the game at very small cost. And then the secret that people conveniently forget is most programs are already doing this. We have to accommodate investigators who have a medicated diet, or they wanna put mice on an atherogenic diet, or they wanna have uh, chemicals in the drinking water that are maybe antibiotics, post-surgery, uh, even though those don't get into the bloodstream in effective doses, so that's a new, a new, a new perspective in uh, lab animal pharmacology. But there may be other things that are required that we're already tolerating on a very small scale. Take that as your starting point and play with it uh, intellectually, operationally, and turn it around. Uh, Mass General's Lab Animal Care Program has this website where they have a lot of their lean management experiences and successes online, so you're encouraged to check that out as well. And so let's talk about the second part of this plan. If we did everything that I just said and eliminated unnecessary work and replaced it with better knowledge, more value-added work, there's still a chance we're gonna need a lot of different people if a lot of our customers want a lot of variety. My, my bet is that most investigators won't care initially. Maybe because they've never been asked before, what would you like to have for your mice? 
And some will be puzzled, and so we can run pilots with them. We can try sand for bedding. We can try different uh, uh, levels of uh, temperature or humidity in that micro enclosure, so on and so forth. Some are going to be irritated because now we've created a more diverse array of options. And they used to have this tidy little box that we took care of everything, and that didn't change until their lab went somewhere else or they tried to replicate somebody else's results, maybe with a different husbandry package. So the second piece of this has to be technology that tracks inventory. And there are some very well-established technology platforms today that have been in use 10 to 20 years. RFID, which is radio frequency identification tags, QR codes. Uh, both of those have been used by Walmart, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, so on and so forth. Product companies who ship a lot of small things around the world. How do you track those? Well, here's what we envision in our world. Take a rack of cages. And every cage on that rack is slightly different from the neighbor. Different bedding, different feed, different enrichment materials. You get the picture. So when the cage is dirty and the mouse is put into the clean cage, we'll have the replacement cage with that exact same combination, obviously ready to go. What happens, though, how do we prepare reliably the next clean cage when that cage is changed in two weeks or less? So as that dirty cage either exits the room or enters our cage wash assembly line process, and we have robotics uh, at Harvard, uh, but that may not matter, there's either going to be a QR code or an RFID tag somewhere that's going to be picked up in that, in that transit from the animal housing room down to cage wash. And then once that goes into there, there's going to be a signal to what I call our kitchen. My, my metaphor today is McDonald's. Because McDonald's will take your order from almost an infinite number of possibilities when you drive up to the window or you go to the counter. What kind of sandwich? What size sandwich? What kind of drink? Large or small fries? What kind of dessert? How many? So on and so forth. Pickles, yes or no? And so this is a shot of McDonald's kitchen. And for those of you who have looked behind the scenes, there's usually a little TV monitor that has the most current orders waiting to be fulfilled. McDonald's does this quickly, cheaply. They almost always get it right. And they use workers from a variety of educational and English fluency backgrounds. What have they already figured out in terms of processing wide variety of input into a deliverable quickly that we may want to emulate. So I, I mean, I'm hoping to get in contact with McDonald's sometime soon and to learn what they've already done. And I don't need to know their secret sauce, literally. I don't need to know how they manage their French fry throughput. But what have they done already operationally? And if it's not McDonald's, it can be a lot of other options that we can learn so when that dirty cage leaves that room or enters the cage wash process, the signal goes down to our kitchen, our cage assembly, cage prep area, where everything is either pre-autoclaved or post-autoclaved. It's going to depend. The signal is for that rack in that room at that rack address, make another to be ready in holding in our working inventory so it goes back. Without this digital component, it's going to be impossible to manage this turnover with the same number or fewer number of workers involved in this operation. That's my pitch today, and I'm happy to answer any questions or if you've got uh, uh, expressions of puzzlement uh, or hostility. They're probably going to be more intelligent than what I just said, but I'd be happy to answer those questions.
So, so the question is, how, how can we standardize maybe some of those husbandry details to avoid either lack of reproducibility or doubt about it? Uh, one of the things that has never happened yet is for journals to publish detailed husbandry descriptions. And now with supplementary data available online, you don't have to crowd out the, the printed version of the journal. You can get to it. But there hasn't been enough push or pull uh, for those kinds of details. I think that if you want to compare apples to apples with your experiments with somebody else's, you have to have those today. And if you were to uh, PubMed um, neurodegenerative disease and environmental enrichment, and mouse models, you're going to see a long list of papers today that talk about how different environmental enrichments are either going to screw up or accentuate, depending upon your point of view, uh, the progression or the delay of onset of Huntington's disease, ALS, uh, Alzheimer's models in mice. Uh, the more varied uh, the uh, environment, the slower uh, progress these diseases seem to make without intervention or treatment in these mouse models. And in order to, again, study apples to apples, somebody has to make that available. If there's any question uh, and it's not published, then my next bit of advice is to make sure that your veterinarian talks to the veterinarian at the other institution so that they can share notes and maybe photographs and maybe a field trip or whatever. Uh, and if it's, if it's our program, we're happy to ship you the uh, barcode and the product in exactly what we order, because maybe not all Nestlets themselves are identical. Good question. In the back. Uh, the question is, could I comment on more complicating factors I get in large animal studies? Uh, I'll, I'll ask you a question back, even though that's rude. Uh, but first, I, mouse studies are pretty complicated today. So it's not like 20 years ago where you dose 20 mice and you count the dead ones in five days, if you're looking at toxicity or something. Uh, but what do you mean by, by complex? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is more along the lines of the wider variety of husbandry environments and housing that may be used for larger species. It gets even more complicated because recently USDA has embraced and enforced the element of social housing for social species, which makes all kinds of sense biologically, behaviorally, and from an animal welfare point of view especially if you're talking about very intelligent species like primates and pigs. Uh, there are studies that show based on individual housing, paired housing, or group housing, you will see differences in brain gene activation in macaques. And so you need more specifics, you need more detail uh, on how that may impact that published study if you're interested in recreating those results. And we don't ever or almost never see those kinds of details. Size of cage, age of cage, um, composition of cage. Is it stainless steel? Is it galvanized? Uh, how often is it washed? What kind of watering system? Uh, do, you, do you pull and collar when you transfer your monkeys? Or do you train them to jump into a transfer cage? Or have you trained them to uh, to uh, uh, allow manual restraint um, with a lot of different safeguards. Those are all differences as well, because we know uh, that, the, that the more used to a procedure an animal is, the less distress or stress it's going to experience. And that leads to a whole biochemical pathway that can skew your results as well. Uh, so more description uh, is always better going forward. Uh, 
Um, and that's as far as I can take it because every place may be a little different. Not a very good answer, but that's the best I can do today. Yes, sir. So the question is, how, how is this going to uh, uh, meet the goal I've set to be cost neutral? Whether it, and the smaller the program, the less, uh, uh, the less cushion you may have or the less waste you have. Uh, that's a fair point. It's been my experience over the last 10 years when I've looked at a variety of programs, whether it's on an ALAC site visit or to consult on productivity or efficiency, about one-fourth to one-third of the, the, either the purchasing costs or the labor hours or a combination of both are a waste. And I'll give you some examples, but the reason we're, we're embracing that first is I want to clear that time, money, and space out of the way to accommodate what may be a ripple or a tidal wave eventually of customized requests. And I think it's going to be gradual. So I've got some I've got some running room. I don't anticipate a, a massive uh, wave of uh, farmers and pitchforks at my castle door saying, I want all of these things changed tomorrow. That, that's not going to happen. When you go to a mouse facility today, and here's my example, usually you wear all kinds of personal protective equipment. You wear shoe covers. You wear a head cover. You wear a paper face mask. You wear either a gown or a Tyvek jumpsuit over your street clothes. You wear gloves. If your mice are in micro-isolator cages that are sterilized or sanitized and then handled only in a laminar flow, HIPAA-filtered hood environment, and you've already screened them for all kinds of excluded pathogens from the vendor or in your mouse import quarantine process, which everybody does, we've known for 25 years that the cage is the barrier. And you don't need all of this stuff that's left over from the 1980s when colonies were infected with a lot of different viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungi. You sometimes had to shower in or change your clothes. All of the air pressure was managed maybe a little bit differently. That's obsolete. But we have brainwashed our customers that without all that garb, your research is at risk because they might get infected by what we may be carrying. There's a paper that came out in June in the Journal of ALAS by some Colombian, uh, Columbia University veterinarians that showed the obvious. They put, they put uh, seronegative mice, mice that were naive of infection, in a very contaminated colony with two very infectious viruses, mouse viruses. The technicians wore over their, uh, their scrub suits all of the standard PPE I just described. Handled the cages only in laminar flow chain stations, which is pretty much the standard today. And it's no surprise those mice did not get infected in spite of being maintained in this cesspool, relative cesspool of infection all around it. Then they gave the technicians uh, mice from the same source in the same dirty colony only gloves or sleeves from elbow to fingertip because that's the only part of you you need to spray down with disinfectant inside a hood when you're changing mice or handling them. And those mice didn't get infected. So they calculate that they can save $150,000 a year by not buying the PPE that they're now buying because they're applying this in a very antiquated method. And I've been told of a couple of progressive programs that have eliminated PPE in a mouse barrier if you're not going to open a cage. And we're sending uh, my other veterinarian to visit one of them next month to take pictures, take testimony, talk to the scientists, look at the health records, and come back and uh, feed that to our investigators. Because I've already started to prepare them for the obsolescence of this approach. That's a big number. When I was at MGH, I think we figured we could save 
250 to $300,000 a year by doing that. Much bigger program. Smaller the program, maybe the smaller the savings, but your, the smaller your costs as well. So proportionally, I'm still confident that it's, this is very worth trying. I have no idea how this is going to work out. Uh, but if you're in academia, you're supposed to have big thoughts and then, and then pursue those. That's kind of our mission. Online question. So, so the question, is this available to people online? Can they see this question? Okay, so the question is, in a static cage, is it closer to the couch potato American lifestyle so it's more representative uh, as a predictor of, of human biology? Mice are nocturnal species, and people have measured how far they travel at night when they're awake. When you walk into a mouse facility during the day, most of the mice are sleeping or they're kind of scrounging around their bedding. You go in at uh, uh, either 11, from 11 p.m. to about 4 in the morning, it's a very busy place. It's like Grand Central Station. Mice will run 800 to 1,200 meters in those cages, whether they're ventilated, static, it doesn't matter. Or if you put them on a wheel, they will generate the same mileage, almost literally, because that's their behavior. Uh, the, the ventilation is only popular for two reasons today. One, it removes ammonia immediately, continuously. Most ventilated cages have air changes of 40 to 60 air changes an hour in those environments. So if ammonia doesn't build up, we can change those cages less frequently. It's a labor-saving device. And so our program and most others, you change those every two weeks instead of twice a week or once a week for a static cage. Second advantage is you can stack more cages in a given footprint of floor space and there are very few spaces more expensive than a barrier facility today with all of the HVAC requirements, lighting, et cetera. And so if I can get more mileage of grant money through a given room because I can put more mice in there, still within a confined space allowed by the guide, nothing has changed there, why wouldn't I do that? But the ventilation rate is uh, immaterial on the, the mouse's level of activity to a certain extent. I know there are colleagues that might be online that are going to call me to that, and we can review all of the publications later, and I can provide those if you're really curious. But that's a fairly representative statement. Are we at the end? One more? Please. Uh, so the question is, how, how, does, how does the Toyota method reconcile with a true customer service because it standardizes everything? It will, it has two parts. One is to narrow the noise. So you start by doing something only one way. But as soon as that one way is established, then you immediately start to tinker with it, but in a very structured process. So if we know that a certain kind of leather is a more comfortable seat cover than another kind of leather or naga hide or whatever it is. We're going to test that, but it's going to be in a structured way. We're going to look at our costs because we have to compete on price as well and how are our customer sets tiered, T-I-E-R-E-D, not T-E-A-R-E-D. And so how is that managed to both the company's benefit, but we don't benefit as a company unless we sell more cars. So it is very customer driven, the, the whole issue of stuck accelerator pedals recently notwithstanding. Are we out of time? I'll leave it to you. Go ahead. So the question is, with robotics, how are we going to customize that because those ro robots are programmed to do the same thing every time. We don't know. 
Uh, I envision in our bedding dispenser, we now have this giant hopper of ground corn cob uh, that comes in in this massive bag. At some point, we're going to have cages with little tags on them that as they enter the bedding dispenser, we're going to put this in batches, I presume. Think about the candy stores that have all those tall funnels of different candies. And all you do is you turn a little spigot at the bottom and you'll get your, uh, your various different kinds of candies. I anticipate an arrangement like that, so we'll have smaller multiple silos for dis dispensation. And there are already a couple of companies now with those options on, on the market. How we tie that to automation and how we tie that to economy, so it's not every cage getting something different, is going to be uh, an experiment that I look forward to running. You've been a great audience. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you.